Hello, everyone, and welcome back from our short break. We know we missed a few episodes, but we had a good reason, okay? Because between CODA and some exciting new changes, PGP is back. On this episode, we're going to be covering the CODA GP, where a few of our girls went to watch the race, and the Mexico GP from this past weekend. Joining us is Hannah, Melissa, Leanne, and myself, Chelsea. And I'm going to pass it off to Hannah to start us off with a little CODA background. So the USGP has actually moved homes more than any other race since F1 officially launched its World Championship Series 72 years ago. With Austin celebrating its official 10th year as the home of Formula One in the U.S. November 18th, 2012, Formula One raced at the Circuit of Americas, also known as CODA, for the first time. The race is held on a purpose-built track, not a street track, by a German architect who is actually a friend from Formula One, come to find out, and his name is Hermann Tilke. I apologize if I said that wrong. Um, The new track spans over 800 acres, and this track is known as some of the best but busiest general emission seating. So some little fun facts about the track. It is 5.514 kilometers or 3.426 miles long with 20 corners. Um, This track actually has a feature that I really like, and that's going like that straight run from the start of the race up the hill into turn one. I don't know why. I really like it. And I don't know, it's maybe because of all the chaos I've seen in the past races, but just seeing them like all go up and into that turn, I don't know why. It's like pleasing to my eyes. But Coda also hosts various motorsports events and they'll actually be hosting the Lone Star Le Mans in 2024. This is one of the FIA World Endurance races held. I thought that was pretty cool because it's been a few years since they last held it there. So kind of exciting knowing that they're going to have a race like this stateside. And currently, Charles Leclerc holds the fastest lap record of 1 minute 36.169 seconds in his den SF90 in 2019. And now that we've talked about some of the history of CODA, let's talk about some of the pre-race fun from the CODA weekend. So for me personally, CODA was a little bit of a roller coaster. Um, So pre-race fun leading up to CODA, we got to experience the Williams pop-up event an Aston Martin karting event. We actually got to meet Jessica Hawkins and Stoffel Van Dorn. And we also got to do a pit lane walk Thursday to kick off race week. Um, We got to see the iconic team photo with Lando and McLaren celebrating 100 races. And many of us there actually got to take photos with the drivers, which was super cool. Honestly, in general, now that... um... I've gone to two races, not a lot, but two. Coda, way better than the Miami one. I'm sorry. It was just so much fun. I really enjoyed how they had so many, like, driver fan areas. And they had this area where they got to talk to Laura Winters, the drivers, I mean. And it was just fun. They got to answer, like, these really dumb questions about Texas and the races and the yearbook photos. I don't know if you guys remember seeing that on social media. Ridiculous. But... In comparison to Miami, I think Coda was way more fan centered. So I definitely recommend it if you want to do like a race in the United States. I enjoyed living vicariously through the girls through Coda weekend um, and their experience. It looked like it was just a lot of fun. Um, just seeing like Chelsea had mentioned like all the activities and the fan experiences and like what Hannah mentioned, like the stuff leading up to the actual race. I don't know. It just like. It like it just feels like it brings like the community like a lot like more together and it's just like we're all here to see a bunch of cars go zoom. Let's make it fun. But I think the favorite thing that like popped out for me was the Aston Martin event, just because it was like a karting event and y'all got to meet the female driver and everything. So it was really cool to watch. Again, I was I had mad FOMO, but it was really fun to watch you guys experience Coda and enjoy it the way you guys did. I will say do not have that much FOMO because I don't even remember Friday. I was passing out. I was passing out from the heat on Friday. Okay. I mean, I know Max got like first place at FP1 and 
the Checo fans were like absolutely rioting. Okay, look, not really. That's obviously me being dramatic. But in the sense that they were booing everything that just wasn't Checo. And if we saw Charles and Lewis finished off the top three for FP1. So lovely moment. But these people, those fans were there for Checo. Like, it was a little bad. I'm going to have to agree with Chelsea on this one. The heat was very rough at the track. Um, as I, for one, was at the medical tent. Um, sad days. We did see Charles do very well in Austin versus he was not very sure if he could be good in interviews leading up to it. So really great practice from him. I, in general, don't remember much just because I use FP one and two as background noise as I'm working or doing whatever I'm doing. <laughs> um, but all I remember is just, again, the Ferraris, their one and two finishes and Red Bull just like struggling. Like for whatever reason, they weren't having the best start to their weekend. I wasn't complaining, but it's just interesting to see just how it kind of plays out for the rest of the days. And then Quali. So Quali, we saw Charles Leclerc in first. Lando Norris in second, and third was Lewis Hamilton, with Carlos Sainz and George Russell kind of really closely behind. I will say Charles wasn't wearing the red pants this weekend. Could that be the reason why he did so good? I want to know. If this is a trend, we got to burn these. Please and thank you. Verstappen would have been on pole if it wasn't for his lost lap time, due to it being deleted for breaching track limits at turn 19, which then pushed him down to P6 for race day. Yeah, when I heard Crofty mention that Max had exceeded track limits, I literally held my breath for like a good like minute. What It felt like a few minutes because it was just like, he exceeded track limits. And I was just like, oh my God. And Charles got his pull. I was happy. And in general, Ferrari and Mercedes were cooking the whole weekend. So I was very hopeful for a very good result on Sunday. But I do like when Max starts in a random grid spot because it's enjoyable to see him like overtake the other drivers and go to that first place. I don't know, just see him like swerve around and just like being like, all right, one more like X amount to go. And I don't know, I'm always kind of like hoping for stuff like this again, just to see a little switch up and a little challenge is always nice. Yeah, I mean, it was another Max, Charles, and Lewis finish for the sprint <laughs> for the sprint shootout. So obviously, this track was doing something pretty well for them. I think it's actually interesting how well they were doing here like that weekend consistently. And even if Max didn't do that well in quality, you know, he did pretty well in the sprint shootout. But um, this <laughs> this is bad. I shouldn't laugh. This is the moment that Max did like a little spin at turn nine, and you probably saw it somewhere online by now. And it was like spin in like a ballerina. <laughs> and I'm not gonna sing it, but everyone knows what I'm thinking. I would have died to have been at that turn to see it like in person, but seeing it on the television was. Like, the screen at my seat was amazing as well. But now that we've talked about the sprint shootout, the sprint. So I believe the sprint was fun, to be honest. Max got pole position. He and Leclerc were neck to neck, and he actually ended up defending him pretty well. But the last length, he lost his second place to Lewis Hamilton. So Max ended up in P1. Lewis P2, and Charles P3. The two drivers were so close behind them in P4 and P5 were Lando Norris and Sergio Perez. So Checo wasn't too bad for the sprint, for all our Checo lovers. It was an event full start to the race with numerous battles playing out throughout the field. Signs fought with the McLarens of Lando and Oscar Piastri, and what proved to be a difficult outing for the Australian, while Ashton Martin had a duo of themselves with Fernando Alonso and Lance Stroll dueling on their own for some reason. I mean, they're teammates. Why are we doing that, bro? Like, we end this together. But overall, I do think it was a very fun experience to watch. And then the race. Honestly, it was truly a fight with McLaren, Red Bull, Ferrari, and Mercedes. 
the, with the teams bouncing between the standings off and on throughout the race. But we did see Lando Norris in like the very first lap lead the majority of the race before ultimately we saw Max Verstappen taking the lead as always. We have three DNFs, Fernando Alonso, Oscar Piastri, and Espan Ocon due to issues with the cars. Max Verstappen set another personal record at the USGP after claiming his 50th win in Formula One and taking the victory despite struggling with brakes for off and on throughout the race. I was also happy to see Lando and Carlos technically take podium positions, you know, two, three respectively, after the race because of some disqualifications, which I know Hannah had some info on. Yeah, so the disqualifications. Lewis Hamilton and Charles Leclerc getting disqualified. So you want to know what kind of that was? Like, what the fuck? So unfortunately, the duo lost their place due to a failed physical floor and plank wear inspection. So the FIA controls the thickness of what the plank should be. And in the instance, they were running the car too low to the ground slash could be perceived as an advantage due to the aerodynamics of the car. So the car runs primarily on aerodynamics. So any type of advantage that is not in the rule book, you get disqualified for. So fun fact. Even though the disqualification brought some not so fun news, on the bright side, Logan did earn his first F1 point in his career. This makes him the first American to get points in 30 long years. Crazy. That's like almost as old as I am. So this is really exciting for him, and we're all glad that he was able to reach this milestone and cannot wait for him to see him get more and more in the future. Honestly, it was a good good weekend. I think Coda was way hotter than I expected. Um, but besides that, it was actually really worth it and a lot of fun, and I'm glad that we have Coda on the calendar, not going to lie. Yeah, um, this was probably my favorite race weekend that I've been to just because we got to see the sprint um, and some many exciting behind the scenes actions that we got to experience, which was pretty cool. Um, But I definitely say I would do this again, despite the heat, but would love to see what other races are there as well for future for the PGP girls. I wouldn't mind if they changed Coda to a night race. I might just go to Montreal. No, no, we're for sure doing I already that. got tickets. <laughs> so whenever y'all are ready for that house, let me know. I am not missing out. And we have a personal photographer to take our group pictures. So we're set. We're set. We're set. Where do I sign? Please and thank you. Or, I mean, we could do Mexico because as we saw this weekend, it's not that boring and you can make a vacation out of it. No, but I did hear that it was just as hot. So I'm all right. Brazil. Why don't we settle on Brazil? Sao Paulo. Do you know how humid Brazil's going to be? (laughs) You're going to die. No, I'm going to Europe, man. I'm going to Canada and Europe. I ain't doing this hot shit anymore. I'll probably get nice cold in Silverstone. Please, Please take me to Silverstone. <laughs> Make it our bucket list now. I'll fall in love so many times in a day in Silverstone. Not even kidding. That's valid, <laughs> actually. But speaking of races, let's talk about Mexico. Let's not. Let's talk about what the heck happened this weekend because that was so many DNFs at the end of the weekend. What? Anyways, let's do a little background first on Mexico now. The track itself, it was built in 1959 by the Mexican president, Adolfo López Mateo, and the racing circuit is in Mexico City's Magdalena Mexuca. Melissa, is that right? I think so. I want to say yes, but I know the X, they use it differently because like for like Oaxaca, it's like O-X. So you might be pronouncing it. It's the X that's driving me off. Mexuca Sports. Could be a McWalker yeah. Sports Park, but honestly, this park, it was pretty built 
pretty quickly. It was built in under a year, and they held their first Grand Prix by 1963. Now, this race is really fun. It's a crowd favorite. Obviously, it used to be a season closer for a few years, and people loved it. Now, the track itself is over two kilometers or 1.3 miles above sea level. So keep that in mind. That's something that's to affect the breathing on them. And it's a 4.3 kilometer or 2.7 mile lap. So the design of the track is pretty neat. It still holds like the original design from when it was first created. The only thing they've changed is like this one turn and it was for safety reasons because it was causing accidents. I think what most fans love about this track though is it's also a vacation hotspot. So you can go over there, watch the races, really enjoy it, and then go travel Mexico City right after. I think what's really cool about this track is the stadium grandstand seating they have at one of the turns. I don't know what it is, but I love how like it looks within the tracks like so perfectly and it gives like the illusion of like the cars like going like under or like in between the grandstands. And I don't know. It's just like really pleasing to like the eye. And I, funny enough, I was talking about going to Mexico City for this Grand Prix and I was just like, if I go and when I go, that grandstand, no less. I mean, of course, paddock passes would be nice, but no less those grandstands. Yeah, and to go along with the history, let's talk about the pre-race. So we had some interesting vibes of Mexico. So we got a taco-making challenge with Pierre Gasly, Esteban Ocon, and Jack Duhan. Thankfully, the food was cooked in advance. Just saying. The challenge was called Specca Tacolor. LOL to the name. And Jack Duhan got to judge of their taco making skills. Similar to the Aussie Burger Challenge we got earlier in the year. It was super funny to watch and see them experience it. Slash see the um, horrendous outcome that came of them making a mess of trying to make these tacos but they're men one of those things (laughs) always love seeing them but i always love seeing a new take on the f1 theme song for this gp and with this one we got the marachi band in the intro of the f1 song and i absolutely love it and i'm here for the different vibes I love the helmets that were designed for this race, especially Checo's. Like, he really went all out for it, and I love it. But something that I really enjoyed was how they did, like, this whole Aztec team this year. And it's, like, really paying, like, homage to the rich, rich Mexican history. And, I mean, it's nice to see because last year they did the whole Dia de los Muertos. So I was like, oh, I wonder if they're going to do that. But I was like, that's technically next week. And it's kind of cool that they're like, no, let's lean this way and make it the theme. So it was really cool to see how they like incorporated that. And did y'all see what Pierre was wearing as he was entering the paddock? Mans was wearing a luchador mask and he had me dead. All I can think of is you guys know how like in Nacho Libre, he yells his name before he fights someone. Pierre Gasly yells his own name before he fights someone. That's what that told me. When I saw that, I was like, Pierre, are you okay? And then I was laughing and said, please scream like like you're in that movie. Like, I would just love a cameo of that. But even when we were in the Mexico GP, we got to see the switching of trophies from CODA officially happen. And did y'all see the videos of the stickers getting placed on the bottom of the trophies as they're being passed over between each other? So... When McLaren received their trophy, it had a Mercedes sticker on it. And then when McLaren handed off the P2 trophy to Ferrari, they put a McLaren sticker on it. And then Ferrari goes up and goes, we got to fix this and puts, a, <laughs> and puts a Ferrari sticker on it. And it was cool to see the mix up of the group of the teams and how they're like making fun of it. And it was a really good vibe. I will say since becoming a fan of F1, I didn't realize how often that would occur where trophies are exchanged amongst people. It's happened way more than I thought it would. 
Yeah, I honestly thought it would have happened before they left Coda, but I'm assuming in the hustle and bustle, they were just like, let's go. Um, but it was cool to see the the fun little videos that came out of it. And then we go into practice. So for FP1, we had Verstappen, Alex, Albon, and Perez. And FP2, we had Max Verstappen, Lando Norris, and Charles Leclerc. And FP3, we had Max Verstappen, Alex Albon again, and Sergio Perez. And I think what we have to talk about, one of my favorite things about this weekend was the five youngins who were jumping onto the F1 grid. Now, for FP1, we had five people jump in for drivers for the grid. We had Oliver Behrman for Haas in car number 50. He took Kevin's place for FP1. And you would know Oliver for like his current first season of Formula 2. That's what he's doing right now. Then we had Jack Doohan, who we just talked about for Alpine, and he was in car number 61. He took Pierre's place, and he's also Alpine's current reserve driver. Then we had Frederick Vesti from Mercedes in car number 42. He took George's place for FP1, and you would know him as well from the F2 series. He's currently second. We also had uh, Theo Pochier for Alpha Romeo in car number 98. He took Valtteri's place, and he's also their reserve driver, and he's in Formula 2. And last but not least, we have Isaac Hajar for Alpha Tori in car number 4. He took Yuki's place for FP1, and you can also find him in the Formula 2 championship. I love when drivers in the other series have the opportunity to like get these practice runs in the car. It just gives them like a chance for like the audience to get to know the other drivers in the other series and potentially just like look at the future grid right in front of them, which is actually kind of like cool to me. Um, And I was like thinking too, I was like, this can also like give an opportunity for other teams to get interested in these F2 drivers, you know, just keeping their option open. You never know what could happen. A seat might open up and they're like, let's take this kid in. We've seen it happen before. So, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's really cool to see that. I, I like seeing them and getting familiar. But one of my favorite things that we got to see this weekend was also quality. I mean, shout out to the youngins. They did a great job. But it is a beautiful moment when you see Charles in pole position. And it's even better when you see like a 1-2 Ferrari start because we saw Carlos follows in second. And don't worry, guys, Max fans, he was there. He got top three. He was in third. My other favorite thing, though, it was so nice to see Danny in the top five, okay? Like, seeing him start fourth position on Sunday, this Sunday that just passed, I think he really needed that, and I think Alpha Tori needed that, too, to, like, prove to people that, look, he's supposed to be here. And Checo, thank God, the guy got fifth. He was at least top five. It was definitely beautiful to see that Ferrari front row lockout. But how about the track limits? I don't know how many drivers got like at some points just like their times deleted. And it was wild because at the end of Q2, Alex made it into Q3, but exceeded track limits and was knocked out. And who got bumped up into Q3? Joe. And I love him. And I was really happy for him and Alfa Alpha Romeo in general. So... I'm very, very happy with that moment. Honestly, though, for the other teams in particular, I was hoping for a better quality from the Mercedes boys. To me, it just looked like they just couldn't get it right and just not improving their time, but it happens. And, you know, we learn and we move on. I will say, in reference to what Melissa said, it seemed like the Alfa Romeo car really was doing good in Mexico, despite it not traditionally being a contender. So it was really cool to see like Valtteri and Joe really like pushing the limits in quality and doing good consistently. <laughs> so I was pretty glad to see that. But in race weekend, like... Chell said, at least Checo got in fifth. But Checo's accident at turn one on lap one and getting our first yellow flag of the race was honestly pretty sad to see. Checo retired at his home 
race. Same thing happened to Lance earlier in the year, and it's got to be very hard on the mental side of it because, like, the fans are there cheering your name. Honestly, I feel really bad for Checo. He's recently come out, like, talking about his mental health and his struggles, and I just feel like this is just not helping at all. And we've all been hearing the rumors and, like, some fans, what they're speculating and everything. I get it. I know what you want to see, but at the same time, it's like, Let's respect Checo. Um, hopefully he can bounce back soon enough because I know he's one hell of a driver. There's just something within him that just needs to get solved. And I want to see the king of the streets, the minister of defense, back. Back, back, back. But speaking of crashes, we had a pretty scary one. Um, K-Mag ended up crashing and it scared the living hell out of me, to be honest. I was really happy he was okay. I just remember at one point I saw the yellow flag, looked at the names, and K Mag was down. I was just like, oh, they probably like spun out or something. And you just see like the car like in pieces. And I had like chills and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, but when they showed the replay, you can literally hear the sound before he like lost control. And it's just like, ugh. However, this crash did lead to a red flag and the race was suspended to fix the barriers and clean up the debris from the incident. Yeah, I had started watching the race a little late. So I joined, I think, like maybe a lap right before this happened. All I could think was, mm, okay, not my best timing. Not my best timing. Felt a little bit like a bad luck track for a second. Chelsea walked in like that one meme, like the guy like walking in and it's like chaos, like in the office going on. You're just like, hey, and like backs up slowly. But I'm not sure what part of the race this happened. But it was either Charles or Carlos's radio comes on and their race engineer was talking about sticking like with plan A. And I allowed just go, they need to go with plan P, Ponte Las Pilas. For my non-Spanish speakers, essentially it's like, let's go, let's get it moving pronto. Except it's just more fun to say Ponte Las Pilas. I just thought it was funny because Ferrari has like a million and one plans. So they have to have Ponte Las Pilas. It would make sense, right? Maybe just in Italian. Plan A, B, C, D, E. All the alphabets. All the letters of the alphabet. One's got to be the correct one, right? Or at least we fucking hope. But when we had the red flag at the Mexico GP, for, fun fact, it was the first time they've had one since the 1989 race. For all my people who like a little bit of a history. But... I want to talk about my favorite part of the race, Lando Norris. He started the race in 17th, then worked his way up to 8th before pitting under a yellow flag, which ended him up in 10th when a red flag was officially released for K-Mag's accident. And they had a standing restart. When the race restarted, though, he struggled for a moment, going down to 14th place before finding his ultimate groove again and his amazing driving skills where he ended the GP in fifth and getting driver of the day. We had a Lando masterclass happen this weekend, and it was fucking phenomenal to see. I wish I was there in person to be like screaming on the top of my lungs for him. You know who was screaming at the top of his lungs for him? His little fan that got to meet him over the weekend. With the sign, love him. I know he's like living life because Lando, 100,000% deserved driver of the day today. And to be honest, I had forgotten at one point he was like at the very back to start. So when I realized that and I saw where he was like finished, I was like, oh, okay, go Lando. When I saw that video of him meeting that fan, I legit cried. Because it was so cute how they saw, like, the poster was shown on TV. McLaren saw, brought him back to the garage and getting to meet him and having that moment and him breaking down was honestly so precious. So precious. It was. And I really always am going to love seeing the drivers with kids. I feel like it brings out a very good side of most of them, if not all of them. So it's always sweet to see. But talking about overtaking, and I was just thinking because, you know, we are getting a little closer to the end of the season. 
I feel like this season has just been so nice with overtaking. Like we have seen a consistent race theme where there's always at least one driver that either kicks ass all the way from the back and makes it like midfield or we get like a midfield who surprisingly gets it to the front. Like even if it was Max who did it, it was still fun to watch. So I I love when we get to see really good overtakes. I think that's what makes racing exciting. Not always being in the front, not always being in the back, but watching the drivers that can get from like P10 to P1 and P19 to like P6. Like I think those kind of things are wild. And that's why I like to watch. I mean, Lewis's performance as well today was just amazing. Mercedes did a good pit stop compared to their usual like 2.8 plus second stops. We won't talk about that today. Plus, he even made that dummy call about the pit stops in general, just so you know, fake out the other teams. Love when I love when they do that in general because it's just like it's like haha, you fell for that. And but it's like at the same time, it's like when do you know when to fall for it and when like not to fall for it? So it's like I don't know. I like thinking stuff like that. But in general, work of art and that overtake into P two from Charles. Oh my god. Charles is a favorite, but so is Lewis. So this moment had me on like the edge of the couch, but Lewis was just so smooth with it and got the spot. But can we talk about how Charles was game booed during his post-race interview? I get it. Fans get passionate about the sport and their favorite drivers. But like he even said, he really had like nowhere to go and it's a racing incident. And even Checo himself wasn't even pointing fingers. Like it, it's irritating at the end of the day. And like, to be quite frank, I'm over the booing. It's embarrassing, but I feel like the booing in general has just been so gross in the Americas, which is like disappointing considering we are the Americans doing this podcast. But I don't know. I witnessed that live. It was really weird to see the booing in like person. I didn't feel comfortable around it. I was like, okay, this is kind of gross. And I'm sure seeing Max win again wasn't a great moment for the Checo fans, but it also just fuels him. It like fuels this man because all those boos from Coda, he brought it right to Mexico and said, here you go. Boo again. And he even said in the post in the post race interview after Coda, not the ones that they do like right after the race, but like later on. They had asked him about the boos. He was like, essentially, he was like, I don't care. I'm the one that takes home the first place trophy. So it's like, I love that energy. And honestly, same, Max, same. I do love how it seems to fuel him to do better and better. Like, I'm just going to prove you wrong. If you're going to be upset, that's on you. That's not my problem. Oh, well, I'm going to win the next race. I feel like that's his mentality. And it's not a bad mentality to have. Especially when you've won, like, what, 16 races in a row? I mean, your track record's great. But we did see quite a few DNFs this race. Fernando Alonso, Sergio Perez, Logan Sargent, Kevin Magnuson, and Lance Stroll due to various reasons. And I think that's the most DNFs I've seen in quite some time. So I hope that this doesn't become a reoccurring trend. I sure hope not. Because I like when people finish races. But the DNF, like here and there, it's like a nice little sprinkle. So in the end, we saw Max winning the race and getting his 16th win of the season. Gotta give him his credit. And what a season. And it's not even like over. We're close, but it's not that close. And we got Lewis in P2 with Charles in P3. I'm happy with the results. Of course, again, bummed out about the DNFs that occurred. But it was a fun race to watch. And I feel like the races in general just have been getting like more and more exciting. And that makes me happy. And with today's results, this puts Lewis within 20 points of Checo's P2 spot in the Drivers' Championship. Will it happen? Will Lewis take the P2 spot? I mean... We are going to do some predictions today, and I do, I'm going to throw that in there and say I predict Lewis taking it because I would really like to see Lewis get first in Brazil. That's our next race coming up. That's what we're going to predict right now. And I think seeing Lewis get that prediction will give him that second place because he's just kind of earned it. 
I mean, you know, maybe we'll give George second. You know, we'll have a Mercedes one two finish. Am I aiming too high? Yeah. But that's just what I feel like is going to work this weekend or this race weekend coming up. It's the end of the season. Well, almost. So we might as well just have a little fun finishing it. Like, Max, let us have fun. Okay? Something to keep us excited for whatever Vegas is going to end up being like. Because God knows how that's going to go. And, you know, I'm also going to predict McLaren in the points. I still have faith in those boys. Ferrari too. And I hope Charles just has some good luck. And we keep those pants out of here. You know which ones I'm talking about. Because the kid needs luck. And I feel like those pants were not helping him. Also, I was thinking about this while I was writing it. This is really out of pocket. What if we just saw Oscar win? Before Lando. Wouldn't that be funny? Just a thought. Sorry, Lando. I would be very happy for Oscar. But then I would probably cry for Lando. (laughs) But that's personal thoughts only. For me personally, for Brazil, I will be in a plane traveling to Canada when this race happens. So I will watch the race late. I will not be watching or reading anything online to spoil it. But if I could come back and see my dream wins, it would be to see Danny Ricardo in the points, if not top five, because he did so great this weekend in Mexico and McLaren slash Ferrari on pole. But we have started to notice, as we saw in practice at the Mexico GP, that Alex Albon is doing really, really good. And I'm honestly proud. He has started to be very consistent in the points, and the Williams team has been making good improvements in the car. And I will personally always have a little bit of a sweet spot for Alex, I think, going forward. Um, And I can't wait for him to get put in a car that is extremely dominant. I'm looking forward to the Sao Paulo Grand Prix. It's a race I hope to attend in the future and a favorite one to watch, like Chels. I am aiming for a Lewis win. He's been inching closer and closer every weekend. And it's hammer time. I don't know. I just have a feeling about this Grand Prix in general. So I'm really banking on this feeling that I got. Um, But we're also just getting to the last few races of the season. I'm very sad. So I want some exciting bangers to round up the season. And I, again, would also just like a good clean weekend for Checo. He needs a confidence booster. At this point, especially after his home GP. So maybe podium, maybe just higher up in the top 10. Just something to help him out. But it's a sprint weekend, so I feel a type of way about the current sprint format in general. So we won't go into that. But while a lot of teams have been improving outside of like the general like top three, four, it does hurt to see what's been happening to Aston Martin. So hopefully they can turn that around with the few races we got and get their groove back. Because I don't know about y'all. I miss seeing Alonzo on that podium. Miss that man. So would love to see that. And now leading into probably my favorite part of our episodes, the pre-outro. And today we're going to talk about the moment of the weekend. So because we talked Coda as well today, I'm going to say getting to be at the track with the majority of the PGP girls was absolutely amazing. Honestly, moments outside of the track days were my favorites, like just exploring and adventuring around town and really getting to hang out with each other was probably the best moment of the weekend besides the race. I'm so glad to be back, and I'm sure you're feeling the difference in this episode. We are now changing up our episodes for the rest of the season and into season two of PGP moving forward. You will now get two episodes a week from us instead of three. Race recaps with predictions on Wednesdays and our random fun episodes will come out on Fridays now. Let us know what you want to hear from us on our Friday episodes. You can reach out to us on socials everywhere we are at Girls Podcast, except on Twitter. There you can find us at Girls Pod. Thanks for joining us in the paddocks. See you on Friday. Bye, everyone. Peace out. Have a good one. See y'all later.